Over the four years that I was there, seven of those kids in youth group became pastors, which is kind of strange. And most of them through Calvary Chapel, um, none of them through the Independent Fundamental Churches of America, which was the church that we were all a part of. But it was during that time, high school years, I started to, started to drift away. And lately, you know, we've been dealing with a lot of uh, questions and trying to answer questions and stuff at Buell, trying to answer these. You guys have probably heard the questions before. Why, why are kids leaving or why do kids leave or why when they go to college don't they come back? And not everybody, but, you know, quite a few will, will disappear. And we've had these conversations and we talked about these things. And, and I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I have a definitive answer other than during, I'm just telling you my personal story. When I was in high school, I stopped spending time with my family. Home was a place where I went to sleep. I got up early in the morning, I went to school, played sports, went and did a job, came home, went to sleep. I still went to church on Sunday, still went to church on Wednesday, still gathered, but my, the family life was, was neatly uh, cut out of my existence and it just became the grind. And I'm 15 years old when I started working. I don't know about some of you guys. I had a full-time job at 15, and I've worked ever since. So, so I, I, I did. I finished high school. I went into Marine Corps. I did all the success things that the world would say, this is what you're supposed to do as a man. And I find myself now as an old man looking back on regret or with regret on the things I wish I could do different. Now, we, we all know we can't change anything, right? So, nails driven, things are done. We, we got to move forward. And Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow, you can't be spending your time looking back or you're not fit for the kingdom of God. So, we got to move forward. And when we talk about moving forward, it's important you understand, we're talking about moving forward under the authority of Scripture. And the problem is, I, in my opinion, our traditions have pushed out Scripture, and they rule. When I was raising my boys, I thought about those three things I told you last night. Okay, are they good on the ball field? Are they good athletes? Both of my kids were great football players. We're a football family. Football is what we did. So my boys played football. They played football from a time we played anything. We tried baseball once, and I thought, that's the stupidest game I ever watched. Sorry. And we tried basketball, and I didn't understand. The guy kept blowing a whistle every time you knock somebody down. That didn't make sense. So we even tried soccer once, and JC got in trouble for so slide tackling as a four-year-old. So, so we decided football was where we, we were at. So how do you make a man? Well, you make an excellent football player, and if he excels on a ball field, that's successful, that's, that's manly. And then... Uh, the second one, I didn't spend a lot of time. Do you want to knock me over? No, no, no. You know, the last time somebody crawled behind me, there was somebody in front of me jumping up. <laughs> I'm going to holler. I don't know what to tell you. Okay, I'll move over here. So, so when we're, so the second one, good in the bedroom. They got, she's got a girlfriend. Uh, it's a pretty girl, you know, so you understand how to treat a woman. But it was, it was not, it was, I didn't have a godly, Outlook on family and biblical manhood to teach my boys. So they didn't get taught that. Excel on the ball field. Be a, be a ladies' man. Somebody that the women would want to go out with. Somebody that they're attracted to. Thankfully, both of my boys picked godly women. So, so, you know, praise God for the Lord being able to hit a strike blow with a crooked stick. Amen? So then the, the third thing, you got to make money. Boys, you need to know how to make money. you got to be able to take care of your family. So the majority of all of that was bunk. And we have spent our lives in, in Christianity since I've been alive, 56 years, in my opinion, 56 years that we have spent in tradition of man and not a bow down to the sufficiency and authority of Scripture. Because the Bible's clear Trust me, when we get done tonight, you're not going to go, I wonder what the Bible says I should do. No, and you know, everything I'm going to say, you know, you've heard it all. 
But hearing and doing, how many know hearing and doing are two different things? So, so I spent a lot of time. And I, I, so I look back at my life and I think, okay, I got distant in the family. I, I broke the family connection. And when family connection broke, I remember my dad left my mom, and I, I thought I was okay with that. But really, that starts my downward spiral, 13 years of rebellion against God. Up until that time, I, I didn't know a rebellious day in my life. But my dad left when I was 18, and I was bitter and angry at my dad, and I blamed God. And so the downward spiral started. And the reason why I was so easy to pick off is because I was not in family. My family, that, that circle was broke. Look, can church take a place to family? Absolutely. But if you're only in church Sunday morning and Wednesday night, how many of you guys know two hours, you have more than two hours in a week? Right? Yeah, there's a lot more hours than two hours in a week. And so there was... There was a pursuit, you know, a, a nagging pull. I, I, gotta, I need to plug into the Lord. And there was always, even in my rebellion, only so far I was willing to go, but I still went pretty far. But, but the point being that that downward spiral led me to 13 years in rebellion against God before God woke me up. And then, you know, I, I, I get my act together, and JC's already born. Cole, Cole was probably little and... Kathy's pregnant with Joe by the time I, I really have my life rededicated, focused on the Lord. I started going to Bible college. I start wanting to be a part of what's going on in the church. And then I had this crazy idea. So, so hear me. I had this crazy idea. I got these three boys, three beautiful boys. And all my boys, they're looking at dad. Dad, that's my job. What's my job? I teach my boys how to be godly men. Right? That's my job. So I, I looked at that and I, and I thought this. I thought, okay, I'm going to focus on God and I'm going to focus on studying and I'm going to focus on ministry and I'm going to make sure my kids are in Christian school and I'm going to make sure my kids are in Sunday school and in youth group and all those things and then they'll be okay. And that's a lie from the pit. That won't do it. I'm a testimony. So you, <clears throat> you look back at my boys, JC's here. <clears throat> You're probably never going to see Cole unless God does a miracle. And my littlest boy is autistic. And, and I, I praise God, I still have opportunity with him because he's still home. And so Joe and I have started something new that I've never done before. But I thought, and this was literally my thinking, if I dedicate myself to God and I dedicate myself to other people's kids and I dedicate myself to other people, other believers, and I dedicate myself to the work of God, then all this other stuff in my house is magically going to just get took care of. And that don't work. It don't work. So you could talk to JC afterwards. He loves when I send people to talk to him. But you can talk to him afterwards, but the reality is my boys don't want to pursue the church. Now, they may have a faith in God, but they want nothing to do with church. You know why they don't want to have nothing to do with church? Because I traded them. So for them, church is a, uh, that's the thing that dad always picked. Should have got more monsters. Ah, uh, uh, poured on my head. <clears throat> That's the thing I always picked instead of them. So, <clears throat> out of all this, it's so dumb. I hate when I do this. <clears throat> Never, le never learned how to be a man. I'm not supposed to cry with a baby. I know. 
So <clears throat> through, through the questions that have come up lately, all this stuff is boiling up to the top. <clears throat> and we've been going through Ezekiel and the, the people of God are in a refugee camp in Ezekiel. And they all think that, that they're there because, you know, they're the screw-ups. And the people in Jerusalem, they're God's favorite. And so God's going to work through them. And, and God's done with us. And Ezekiel's job was to tell the exiles, no, you got it backwards. All the people in Jerusalem are going to die. And God's going to rebuild with you. And I look at <clears throat> all the political garbage in our world and our focus on, on all this stuff and we're wasting energy and effort to something God never told us to focus on. We, he gave us a commission and it was never, you know, lose your mind for President Trump or you lose your mind for the other guy. It was, never, it was never about that stuff. It was supposed to be about discipling. When Jesus told his disciples, he's standing before his disciples in the Gospel of John, after the resurrection, and he says, this is what I'm going to do to you guys. I'm going to send you out like my Father sent me. You're supposed to go. What are they going to do? They're going to disciple. What's the next group going to do? They're going to go disciple. What's the next group going to do? The teaching class, I don't know if that's a good word, of the church is the elders. The Bible speaks that the elder women are supposed to teach the younger women. The elder men, the younger men. There was a point in my life when I went through church and I never, ever, 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 ever heard the voice of an elder in the church. I heard the voice of my youth pastor, thank God for him. I heard the voice of, of other people, but the Bible tells us that the elders are the ones apt to teach, right? Able to teach. Why are we there? We're not there to pour over all the financials and complain that the pastor took too many vacations. What the job of the elders are is to look over and see and find young men to do what everybody has done throughout the beginning of the church to today, which is discipling people, raising them up, and equipping them. Because the majority of guys I talk to when I say, you need to be a, leadership, a leader in your home. You need to teach your kids. And they say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what it means. Remember last night I told you we accept mediocrity. What other job can you say, I've been, a, I've been a plumber for 20 years, and somebody comes to you and says, oh, you, can you change out my toilet? No, I have no idea how to do that. You've been plumbing for 20 years, you don't know how to change the toilet? No, you're not a plumber. Isn't that what you would say? So what do you say to a believer who says, I've been a believer walking with Christ for 20 years, but I don't know anything about him? I can't share what I know or what the Word of God says with someone else. Men, that is why we are where we are today. Amen. That's the reason. Now, we, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to make anybody feel bad. Well, I am. You should feel bad. You should repent. You should cry out to God for forgiveness. And then you should move forward. Not looking back at our failures. Yeah, do we fail? Sure. Do we have a generate? Do our, does, does the generation today of young people today know anything about Christ? You spend any time, you don't got to go, go down to CSI, start walking, unless you get lucky and bump into a couple of kids from the Bible club, you're going to talk to people who have no idea about anything about Christ. Nothing. Except for maybe what they see on TV. Which, by the way, is not a good example. Right? So we need to be about this. We need to be about the work that that God wants to do, what God wants to accomplish. We need to be training up our children as men. You don't have a wife yet? Well, good for you. You need to know what you need to do to be a husband. You need to know these things so you can be a father. 
And if you know more about the Lord Jesus Christ and the guy next to you, then you are capable of discipling. Amen? Amen. So we can be engaged in that. We have what majority of kids today grow up in a zero parent home, right? They spend eight hours a day in school, give or take, three hours on some form of social media. Eight, nine, 10, 11. They're going to sleep for, let's say, eight hours, probably not, but we'll just throw that out there for a round number. So we got eight, nine, 10, 11, and, and eight, 19 hours. Are you filling that time? with instruction about the scriptures? Are you teaching them how to find a godly man for uh, your daughters to find a godly man for a husband? Are you teaching your boys how to find a godly woman for their wife? Are you helping them to understand how to navigate this crazy world through the truth and sanctity and authority of the word of God? Because unequivocally, that is our job that was my job i failed that is our i'm a pastor and i failed i got kids that still today will write me letters about how important my time with them was for them but my own boys don't have anything that the kid i poured into had what business do i have pouring into somebody else if i'm not pouring into my kid at home And there's nothing, by the way, in Scripture that says I can abrogate my responsibility to my boys. There's nothing. You're going to see them. I've been, <clears throat> I've been chewing on this stuff for, <laughs> I don't know, a long time. Seems like a long time. And so you guys, about all the barrels are coming out, so just hold on. <laughs> what is it that God wants? Listen, this is what God wants. He wants men with trained minds. Men with trained minds. This is our job. Not school's job. Not teacher's job. Certainly not college's job. Their job is to lead everyone into the world. Our job is to make sure that our children or our children's children or our neighbor's children or the people God gives us to disciple have trained minds. It is our job to make sure that men understand how to walk a walk of godly biblical character. What does godly biblical character look like? It is our job to, to get this generation to start to have a multi-generational view. And what I mean by that is that you're not going to fix it today. You're not going to fix it today. They couldn't fix what they broke at Kadesh Barnea for 40 years. They couldn't fix what they broke in, in Judah for 70 years. We're not going to fix it in a day. You're not going to fix it by doing a, getting ourselves pumped up and excited and run down a mountain and forget who we are. Multi-generational view. That means you've got to be focused in the, what I call, long game. Long game. One day at a time, every day, focused development. And we need men committed to the glory of God. We need men not committed to the glory of self. I, I really like the glory of self. The glory of self is probably one of my favorite things. And if you guys are honest, it's probably one of yours too. Everybody likes it when somebody gives you glory, don't you? Oh, we just had a bow contest. Everybody likes to be the winner, no? Otherwise, we wouldn't compete. And we talked about those things are, are God ingrained. There's a purpose for those things. But our focus is to be for whose glory? Right? It's not a test. We should be able to figure that out. Right? Men focused on the glory of God. Warriors for Christ. So we got to deprogram our focus in life. Our focus is screwed up. We're running on tradition, not on the authority of God's word. So we need to jettison the traditions, jettison the thing where here's one a great thing to jettison. I go to work all day. I work 12 hours a day. I'm slaving. I'm doing everything to provide for my family. I come home, put my feet up, lay back in a lazy boy, watch TV. Jettison it. You don't need it. You ain't that tired. You're a man. I know men 
who in battle have lost their legs continue to run on stumps and fight off the enemy. Don't tell me you're too tired to be who you need to be for your wife and kids. Jettison. You don't need it. We, there's things we got to get rid of, right? We're, you'll see. I'm going to show you the scripture for it as, as we go. Here is a scripture that, that dictates who we are today. Judges 17.6. Don't be shy to look stuff up, write stuff down. I'm gonna, we're going to be throwing Bible everywhere, so, so be ready. That, that Bible is the most important thing in your possession. You need to read that book. It will change your life. <laughs> Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in authority. Listen to what that means. In those days, there was no authority in Israel. Let me ask you a question. Where's the authority in the United States of America right now? Is it the police? Is it the government? Is it you? Is it me? Where's the authority? Nobody knows. So what's everybody doing? Exactly what they were doing in Judges, right? Everyone did what was right. How? In his own eyes. Now, how do we, how do you live like that? You can't. There's no objective truth. There's no objective authority. There's your opinion, my opinion. They don't meet, so I get a bigger rock than you, I win. Right? Or I wait till you're looking the other way, and then I hit you with a bike lock in the back of the head, or whatever. And so, this is what marks us. There is no authority in Israel. What is our authority? So here's my point. Our authority is Scripture, and we have been disobedient to God's Word. We have been disobedient to God's command, and we owe God repentance. We owe confession to the Lord, and we owe it to stop. No excuses. We are men. We are not babies, we are not children, we are men. And we can do this. You are able. I don't care how young you are, and I don't care how old you are. I don't care how far you can run. I don't care how high you can jump. I don't care about any of those things. I care about, do you understand that the Word of God is the authority, and we need to be in obedience to God's Word. Amen? Amen. We want to walk with the Lord. 2 Timothy 3.16, here's the question. The Word of God is authoritative. I want to ask you this. Is it sufficient? Is the Word of God sufficient? Yes. Okay, if the Word of God is sufficient, then we're going to have a whooping coming. 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable <clears throat> for teaching. You guys know this Scripture, right? For reproof for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God, what's the next three words? May be complete. Is the word of God sufficient? Is the word of God sufficient to make you complete? What's he say next? Equipped for a few good works? Every good work. So the word of God will teach us, will reprove us, will correct us, will train us in righteousness so that we can be complete and equipped for every good work, right? So, so we hear what's in the word of God. Here's, I, I always say this, guys. Uh, we can sit around and we can talk about eschatology and when's the rapture coming and, and what's, the, what's it look like at the end of days and there's lots of space for lots of conversation in there. You know, what I don't know about the Bible does not scare me. What I do know about the Bible and completely understand about the Bible and fail to do, that scares me. Not what I don't know. Does the Bible say a husband is to love his wife? You know that's what it says. You're supposed to love her, wash her with the water of the word, present her before the world spotless, blameless, perfect, just as Christ is going to stand you before the Father and present you perfect and blameless. Do you do that? Don't tell me it's not because you don't understand it. We know what it says. We want to know why our world's crazy. What's going on? What's happening? Because we have slid into down a hill of apathy and complacency, and now we're losing our kids, and we better wake up. Or you're going to be, I've done so many 
uh, um, suicides this year, suicide funerals, it breaks my heart. All 20-year-old kids who lost hope and made bad choices, and now there's not going to be another one, right? We need to get to where we're prepared to do what God's Word tells us. Hosea 4.6. Hosea 4.6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What knowledge is it that the Lord is saying to Hosea? What knowledge... What have they forgotten? What knowledge do they lack? He says, because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest. Why? You have forgotten the law of your God. What knowledge were they lacking? The scriptures. They didn't know the scriptures. They didn't know God's requirement and they, and they weren't walking in obedience to what God's word was calling them to. And because they didn't know that, the Lord says, because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you. Look at our nation. You think that all this is happening because God's blessing is on the United States of America? You are cracked. This is happening because the people of God bear responsibility because we're not doing the things we know we ought to do because we've allowed the culture to dictate. We've allowed the culture to change our attitudes. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 6 says this. I think it uh, sounds like the Lord speaking straight to the United States. This is Isaiah talking to, uh, to Judah prior to, to Judah's fall to Babylon. A sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, and they are utterly estranged. Look, he's not talking about the nation, he's talking about his people. They're supposed to be his people, right? So when we, when we, we take that, look, I, I get... He's talking to Israel about Israel's failure, but here's what I want you to see. Israel was supposed to be his people. They knew God. God had revealed himself to Israel like he'd revealed himself to nobody else. Would you agree that's how God has revealed himself to the church? That God has revealed himself to the church? Like, is there, is there a better revelation of God than Jesus Christ? According to the book of Hebrews, there's not. So he's laying this out. He says to them, will you be Will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head. There is no soundness in it. But bruises, sores, raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. What's he saying? He's saying you're wounded. You're wounded and headed for judgment and you're not treating the wound. We, as a, as a church, the church of, of the Lord God Almighty in, let's just say, Idaho, are wounded, battered, and beaten on the brink of judgment, and we're not treating the wound. What does it mean to treat the wound? To bind up that which is broken. What did Jesus say? I've come to bind up the broken hearted, right? To set captives free. That, that's what Jesus does. So if we find ourselves in captivity or we find ourselves bruised or broken, then we need, to, we need to treat that. How do we treat that? We treat that through confession, not through denial. Not through denial. Not denying that it's here, but rather confessing <coughs> that it is. Are we reflecting the scriptural truth? 1 Corinthians 10.31, what's it say? Who knows it, anybody? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Is that clear? Yes. Do we know what we should do? Do all for the glory of God, right? To, to honor God in all we do. To glorify Him. 2 Corinthians 10.5 We destroy argu arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Do we understand it? 
take every thought captive in everything we do, whatever we do, do all we can for the glory of God, right? This clear teaching we, we understand. So I want to give us, that was the introduction. So I want to give us three things we want to focus on as men to stand in biblical manhood, to fulfill the purpose that God has called us to as men, to be the, the instrument within the family of our family, knowing the scripture, understanding what the word of God says, accepting the responsibility and the authority that God's given to understand that that's, that's my role, not somebody else's. And nobody has to let me. That's, that's my, I'm going to give an account to the Lord, right? So I want to be able to respond uh, in, in the way that God has given. There's three things, three things that I think God indicates to us prior to the fall of man that are the foundation. Now you can branch off to this and make a hundred things if you want. I'm going to give you three before the fall that are God's design for the authority of men and the job men need to be doing. Biblical manhood 101, okay? So we're going to take a look at the first one, Genesis chapter 2. We'll be in Genesis chapter 2, although we're going to look at some other scriptures before we come back to it. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 15. It says, we're after the creation of man. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. That's before the fall. What did God give man? He gave man a job to do. Yes? Work the garden and keep it. Work the garden and keep it. So rule number one, or whatever our... The, the step, the path that we want to follow, be it men committed to God honoring labor. Men who are committed to God honoring labor. Is it God honoring to provide for your family? Yes, it is. Right? That's a role. The Bible tells us a man who doesn't take care of his family is. So that's not good, right? So we want to be men who provide for our family. That's, that's part of it. Yes, that's part of it, truly. We want to understand that laziness is our destruction. And of all animals, great and small, the male animals struggle most with laziness. Amen? You ever seen a male lion? What is he doing? He's laying in the shade somewhere. And what are the women doing? They're out hunting, killing, and when they get it, who eats first? That big dude who's been doing nothing but laying in the shade. He gets up and he eats, and then what's he do? He goes back to laying in the shade. This is something we see, a, a, what I would call a struggle throughout the animal kingdom. Let's hear what the Word of God says about it. What does the Word of God say about it? Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 6, another section you guys will be familiar with. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer, gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want upon you like an armed man. So we can look at that and we can say, yep, I got a job and we're not in poverty. We're okay. But your job entails more than just provision for the family, right? Your job is also to make sure that your family is instructed in righteousness. No, your job is to make sure the family understands the scriptures, right? Your job is to make sure that your children know the stories that, of what God has done in your life, how God has delivered you. Scripture's all very clear on that call. But if we're too tired at the end of the day to do any of those things, then the poverty that will come upon you will be the loss of your children. Your children will abandon the faith. 
Some of you guys already know. Your children will abandon the faith. Laziness is a coward, men, and we are not cowards. We are called to be warriors of Christ. Proverbs 26, verse 13. The sluggard says, There's a lion in the road. There's a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard in his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but it wears him out to bring it to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. The point is, laziness will always find a reason not to do it. Laziness will find a reason why you shouldn't go to church. Laziness will find a reason why you shouldn't get involved in discipleship. Laziness will find a reason why you're too tired to pray with your wife at night. Laziness will find a reason not to get up early in the morning and pray with your kids before they go to school. Laziness will always find a reason. But men of God are not called to be lazy men. Amen? We're not, to be call, we're not called to be lazy men. We're called to be men of God. And will God give us what we need to be able to do it? Yes, you know you can learn to do anything? Well, the first day I showed up to boot camp in the Marine Corps, my drill instructor walked up to me, stood about a quarter inch from my face, spit all over me. Spit was dripping out of my eyeballs. He said, you don't even know what it is to be a man, but when this is over, when this is finished... You're looking over there at those planes at the San Diego airport. And I was looking at the planes because I was thinking, I want to, I'm one of those. Anything that gets me out of here. He said, when you're done in here, I'll look over at that plane and I'll say, go get me a plane and you'll go get it. And I thought to myself, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. I'm not ever going to do nothing you say. Oh, man. 13 weeks later, it was, sir, yes, sir, I'll go get a plane right now. All that was necessary was discipline. Oh, that's another role of a parent, isn't it? Is that another role in the hands of a man? Interesting, no? So we're not called to be lazy. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, Jason was talking about this with some guys um, earlier re referencing something similar. Second Thessalonians 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not walking according to the tradition that you have received from us. This is Paul. Right? Don't, don't watch out for a brother who's lazy. Follow our example. Paul's saying follow our example for you yourselves know uh, how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were among you. We did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. With toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. And it was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command... And encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do your work quietly and to earn your own living. Laziness is not the way, right? That's not the call God has given us. 1 Timothy 5, 7. Command these things uh, as well, so that you may be without reproach. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So... Step number one, biblical manhood, following the example of Christ. We are men committed to God-honoring labor. Not just a job, all God-honoring labor, however long the God-honoring labor takes. Amen? Amen? However long that day, whatever that day looks like. That's number one. Let's look to number two. Number two, men who are committed to obey the law of God. By the law of God, I'm talking about the Word of God. Men committed to obey the law of God. Now,